Hey there everybody, this is Chris Hargraves from tipsforlawyers.com and welcome to the Tips for Lawyers podcast. This is podcast episode 53. It is somewhat towards the start of 2016, but not as close towards the start as you might think, which means we'll be getting ready for Christmas anytime soon. Today I wanted to start a new series on the podcast, and I don't yet know how many parts it's going to be, so what I know is that this is part one, and I'm going to call it the Real Lawyer series. And through it, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a look at some of the characteristics that real lawyers have that you don't necessarily think about. Some of them might be obvious to you, but not necessarily to others, and some of them might be a little more subtle. But I also wanted to explore how to go about adopting utilizing and practicing those particular character traits. And I could define them as skills. After all, I do a lot of legal skills, but some of them are a little bit different to legal skills. They are perhaps more practices or procedures or character traits or things that you might want to be thinking about. So I'm calling it the Real Lawyer Series. And today we're having a look at integrity because real lawyers have integrity. Recently in the news, depending on when you're listening to this, Hillary Clinton made the uh, fairly hilarious observation that she doesn't think that she's ever lied, which is pretty amusing in the circumstances. Uh, If she hasn't ever lied, that would make her possibly the most honest person ever to have lived to have made it through both toddlerhood, childhood, adolescence, and into her adult years without having ever lied. And I strongly suspect uh, that she might not necessarily be telling herself and everyone else the truth about that. And that actually sparked the topic for today. And it reminded me uh, that in many, many circles of trust and of visibility, and your legal career is one of those, Integrity is such a fundamentally important character trait to cling on to desperately. And in the profession and in the ebb and flow of day-to-day practice, it can be very easy to start making decisions which slip away from that level of integrity that really ought to be maintained. So what am I talking about? Integrity is similar I guess, to honesty, but I think it goes beyond honesty. Honesty is a slightly more, I guess, soft term than integrity. Honesty sometimes has more to do with what you're saying to people and less to do with the things that you choose not to do, the things that you choose not to say, and perhaps the things that you choose not to take responsibility for. I think integrity is a more intrinsic characteristic of someone honesty. I mean, you can be an honest person and have integrity at the same time. Obviously, the two are not mutually exclusive. However, I think that integrity is more of an internal character trait and honesty is more the way in which that internal character trait presents itself. So that's the distinction I'm using. It is based on precisely zero minutes research and it's how I'm going to run with integrity today. So I consider integrity to really be a fairly broad concept across your legal practice. And today I wanted to deal with it in a few different day-to-day activities that you're going to have as a young lawyer or as a lawyer at any stage of practice or even as a law student from time to time. And I think the first thing so far as integrity is concerned relates to how you treat your colleagues. Now, what do I mean by that? Obviously, you can't go around uh, slagging off at your colleagues. And I'm going to try and avoid really blatantly obvious things here uh, because I think everyone knows that if I go and start telling lies about my colleagues left, right and centre, then by and large, I'm probably going to be found out and fired pretty quickly. And that will be 100% the correct decision because I shouldn't be going around lying at people with a view to disadvantaging them. So we need to look at some of the more subtle presentations of a lack of integrity. And in particular for young lawyers, uh, this can come up in a number of circumstances. 
and it might come up adverse to you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use some examples to sort of start to describe and paint the picture of what I view as being integrity in legal practice. And in a highly competitive field such as law, one of the things that can become uh, very tempting is to take credit for other people's ideas, for other people's research, for other people's drafting, and perhaps for other people's insight or wisdom. Now, we need to be a little cautious here because what we need to also do is we need to respect the fact that sometimes we will not be the communicator of our own ideas. And if you have, for example, done a research memo for your supervising partner and they then present that to the client as the answer that the firm is providing to that client, then I don't think you necessarily have a right to jump up and down and say, hang on, you didn't actually use my name at all in that conversation. Because at the end of the day, that's your job. And there are a few things to be aware of there. The first is that your partner is the one the client trusts, probably. They are, of course, someone who has checked your work, or at least verified your work, before presenting it. So in a sense, it is a collaborative approach, even though you feel like you have done the legwork. And finally, there is a client confidence issue, which is if you are a law student, a graduate lawyer, first year lawyer, and a 30 year partner goes to their client and says, oh, I had the first year law clerk do some research and uh, here's the result of that research. So that's the answer we're going with it's not necessarily going to inspire confidence in the client. So by and large, you will find that firms will present answers as firms and not necessarily with that kind of attribution that you might be seeking. I don't consider that to be a lack of integrity. However, there is a blurry line somewhere in the middle as to where that becomes appropriate or inappropriate uh, because there are times, and I expect you might have seen them or you will see them very soon, where your actual ideas are presented as someone else's idea. You come up with a master plan to win the case or get the contract across the line, and then you overhear your partner telling someone, oh, so I came up with this great idea to do uh, X, Y, and Z, and uh, it nailed it. Now the client loves me because I told them how great I was. Um, that, personally, I think crosses the line. Now, I know a lot of people are going to disagree with me about that one, but I think it falls into the category of credit where credit's due. If the idea was yours, then by all means present it as your idea. If the idea was not yours and you feel like there is an issue with presenting or naming the thing that the other person thought of, then present it as the firm's idea, as a collaborative approach. We have adopted this strategy uh, in consultation with such and such, we came up with a plan, that sort of thing, because legal practice is ordinarily a team effort, and I don't have a big issue with that being presented in that way. But where your ideas are, in fact, claimed as being those of someone else, that I do start to have an issue with. But it works in the same way for you. So what I want to encourage you in all of these examples of integrity to do is to take a look at what currently occurs around you and... Ask yourself whether you're starting to fall into a similar pattern, if indeed the pattern is an adverse one or one that you don't necessarily agree with. Are you, for example, having clerks do research and then presenting that research to the partner as your own? There's one example. Are you having someone else draft letters for you? Depending how senior you are, you may or may not have these options, but are you having someone else draft letters for you? Are you getting feedback from senior people and then claiming that as your own idea? or not. Because often uh, in a collaborative firm with an actual open door policy as opposed to a fictitious open door policy, it's not uncommon in many areas for junior staff to seek guidance from senior staff. The senior staff might or might not actually charge the clients for that because it's part of their mentoring and training of the junior staff to do their jobs better. But how are you, if you are in that junior staff category, approaching your presentation of that idea? It's an interesting one because I have a feeling that if the idea went horribly badly, you'd be fairly quick to say whose idea it was. So think about it that way, I think, is a good way to consider it when you're looking at it from the idea of whose idea was this and whose idea should I present this as being. Sure, you may have done a lot of the work, but if it's 
you think appropriate and ethical and moral to give a nod to someone as a contributor to that, then by all means do it. And I'm not talking about anything formal. I'm not talking about putting someone's name on the bottom of a letter, but saying, by the way, the ideas in this letter came from such and such, because that's going to be silly and clients are going to wonder what the heck is going on. But I think it's appropriate to acknowledge the contributions of your teammates, even those who are competitive with you, because it is a team and it's a collaborative environment. So in your integrity with others, what I think we need to start looking at as a profession is avoiding this concept of me, 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 my personal growth, my clients, my budget, my talent, my achievements, because often that is not an accurate description. There are many contributors to your achievements going from the admin team to the finance team to the marketing team to your legal assistant or your secretary to yourself to your supervisors to your partners to the three people you checked with about your idea before you presented it to the client. There are a lot of contributors and you will find that your language will adapt if this is an issue for you simply by virtue of changing your mindset to actually appreciating and understanding the contributions of the many people who in fact have weighed in to the end product. So that is integrity with your colleagues. The next one that comes up if you're in a time charging situation is integrity with your time. There is a uh, disturbing habit among many lawyers to pad their time. And this is, of course, uh, the argument that many people make about lawyers and time charging and why time charging is not a good thing because they believe it encourages lawyers to be dishonest and it can result in inflated costs and also the fact that the lawyer has to meet a budget of x hours billable time a day also encourages the fictitious recording of time. Now I'm not sure that that happens too much but I am certainly sure that there is a temptation to do it. Should I put down six units or five units? Well, the answer is you put down however many units you actually spent doing billable time. But then within that, what if you spent some time, for example, doing an administrative task or you went and got yourself a glass of water or you picked up another phone call for a couple of minutes? Are you going to allocate all that time to the same file because it's such a pain in the neck to record and pause your time all the time? Yes, uh, you are going to do it properly And I have no doubt that you're going to use your best efforts to do that, but you need to be cautious and you need to be constantly monitoring what you're doing. If only for the entirely practical and financial reason that having a good appreciation of how busy you are is being monitored by your senior practitioners who are seeing how much time you're recording and seeing how busy you are as a result. And through that, they can manage their delegation systems. They can see who has capacity to work on other things, who might need to uh, have some further training in their time recording or a discussion of some kind to find out why their time recording is so high or so low or so whatever. That is the kind of information that the partners and the managers need in order to actually keep the firm running efficiently. So if your time remarkably every day comes out to precisely how much your budget is, then I'm going to hazard a guess that in fact you are managing your time recording in such a way as to achieve that result. Give that some thought as you go ahead because ultimately as Easy and tempting as it is to slip into a habit of recording time in a casual manner, your accuracy is fundamentally linked to your integrity and your honesty as a practitioner. So I thoroughly recommend keeping an accurate time record and entering your time as accurately as humanly possible if you are in a firm that time records. The next one that is always interesting to me is charging. Now, in a highly regulated industry like law, we don't necessarily have the same flexibility with what we end up billing our clients as we do, say, if we were accountants or something else like that, where they look at a work and go, okay, well, I reckon we can get away with a bill of this. And then the client pays it because accountants are viewed as all round good guys and lawyers are viewed as all round bad guys or a necessary evil. Now, We don't have that same flexibility for a few reasons. First, we have given estimates to our client. As a rule, most jurisdictions require estimates to be provided in most circumstances. 
And so we need to either be within those estimates or we need to have told the client why we might not fall within those estimates. That is something we simply have to do. And so when you start looking at your bill and going, oh, cripes, we went over that estimate. What was the real reason? Because the temptation is to actually blame your client. Client gave me more work. Client uh, sent through 100 more documents than I was expecting and I spent 15 hours longer than what I was anticipating. It's in fact not the client's fault if you have failed to monitor your estimate and fail to update them when they have given you those instructions. Certainly, it is the case that you should anticipate your client will give you more instructions than what you originally thought. That happens very, very regularly and it's something you need to be live to. So you should be accounting for that in your estimates anyway. But when the billing time comes, who are you actually going to look to? Are you going to recommend a reduction in the bill or are you going to bill outside your estimate even though you fail to monitor the situation? Again, this comes down to this fundamental question of integrity and sometimes you can call the client and be upfront with them. Bob, we went over by $280 compared to what we told you it was going to cost. Is that okay? It ultimately, we spent a bit more time because of those 37 emails you sent us that we weren't really expecting. If Bob has a big issue with that, he'll let you know on the phone. If Bob doesn't have a big issue with that, he will also let you know on the phone. That is the upfront way of dealing with it if your decision is to try and bill. The other option, of course, is to take a look at reducing your bill. You might or might not need to call Bob before you make that decision. So have a look at how you treat your clients, in particular in connection with finances, in particular in connection with time recording, and in particular in connection with how much time you're devoting to a particular task if it's going beyond what you thought you were going to have to spend. Now while we're on the topic of integrity with clients, I wanted to, I guess, highlight an example which I see fairly regularly about status of work. Now, lawyers have a lot of work on as a rule. Uh, we do work pretty hard as a rule, and we have a tendency, I have noticed from time to time, to overstate the status of tasks when clients follow us up. So if a client asks us to do something and a week passes and we haven't gotten very far, and they go, hey, how's that letter going that you were going to do for me? The temptation is to say, oh, yep, it's nearly there, and then to furiously do it and make sure you get it out in the next couple of hours to the client for review so that it is a self-fulfilling prophecy that it was nearly there. But is that really the utmost integrity that you need to be focusing on in your legal career? If you were the client and you were told it was nearly there, what would you think? You would assume that the draft was nearly produced or that the draft had been produced and was just subject to review. So ignoring for a moment the objective truth of what you said, that it was nearly there because you were about to drop everything now that you've been followed up and do something about it, what were you really telling the client? How were they hearing that comment? Because it's really the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It's not especially difficult to grasp that the concept will, uh, the client will make certain assumptions about what you meant when you said that. Uh, it's nearly underway. We're just finalizing the drafting now. I've put it into my partner for review, meaning I'm about to put it into my partner for review, or so on and so forth. The The various sort of platitudes that we give clients in the hope that they won't get annoyed that we've just spent seven days not doing the thing that they asked us to do. You really need to be careful. And again, you may or may not actually uh, ever do this in a way that you notice, but we do start to manage expectations in a way that doesn't necessarily abide by the strict high standards of integrity that I think the legal profession should have. And again, it is tempting if a client has called you and they're agitated, but temptation is not necessarily a good reason to do it. So consider, how can you manage both expectations and client relationships in such a way that permits you to be open and upfront and authentic and honest with your client about deadlines and status of tasks and times for delivery. Because keeping that information and communication flow going is going to serve you better than making excuses when you follow it up. And I think the last thing I wanted to deal with in integrity, because we're coming up on the 20-minute mark, uh, which is about usually when I start to wrap things up, is integrity with yourself. And in a profession with a lot of issues, 
and a lot of personal issues and a lot of substance issues and a lot of depression and a lot of emotional problems, I think integrity with yourself as to when you are hitting your limit, as to when you are not coping with things, as to when you need to stop saying yes to work and start saying no to work, and as to when you need a holiday, and as to when your personal life is suffering, these things are things you need to be brutally honest with yourself about. And you can lie to yourself very easily about the status of those things. In particular, you can lie to yourself about the status of your relationships. You can lie to yourself about the status of your stress. You can lie to yourself about the status of your overworkedness. But if these things are building up on a day-to-day basis as problems, then you need to be live to those issues and you need to not deceive yourself into thinking that everything will be okay. There will be heightened short-term periods of stress in the legal profession. I don't think anyone is going to argue with me about that. But if you are suffering as a result of it, then you need to have the honesty to deal with yourself because other people won't necessarily pick it up. And you need to be prepared to say, no, I need to take a week off. I need to take that day off. I need to stop working 14 days an hour or I need to stop dealing with this client because they're driving me crazy. Whatever the situation is, You need to be honest enough with yourself to actually have the ability to make that stand, to make that decision, to make that request, and that way you will be able to function over the longer term because it's the lawyers who lie to themselves about their situations who get into trouble. The lawyers who keep saying yes to work even when they're overworked are the ones who end up with claims about failing to deliver work properly or on time because they were doing so in such a stressed environment. So, integrity with yourself. What have we covered off on? We've covered off on the fact that real lawyers have integrity. And I've given you some examples, and I've given you some examples because integrity is very hard to define. But have a look at those examples. How are you expressing integrity with your colleagues? Are you honest with them? Do you see yourself in competition with them? Do you acknowledge good things and bad things when they happen? Do you take responsibility for things? What about your time and your charging? If you're time recording and how you're doing it, are you padding your time? Are you rounding up when you ought not? Are you trying to get to your budget rather than trying to work hard for your clients? Those two things go hand in hand, but if you're trying to do the former, it won't necessarily be the focus point that you're supposed to have by doing the latter. Again with clients, how do you manage their expectations in an open and upfront way? Do you have integrity when you're doing that or do you start to massage the truth a little bit so that they feel mollified? And finally, with yourself, are you honest about the situation you find yourself in? Are you honest about how stressed you are, how overworked you are, how much things are going okay at home or otherwise? You need to be live to those issues and honest with yourself and prepared to take the necessary steps to fix things up. So that is the end of Real Lawyers Have Integrity, part of the Real Lawyer series. I will see you in the next one. You can uh, head over to iTunes, would be great, and leave a review at tipsforlawyers.com slash iTunes. We'll take you straight to it. Always love those reviews and those star rankings. Keeps us visible and helps me stay in uh, those helpful lists that other people can get to see and listen to the podcast too. So if you enjoyed this one, share it around, let other people know about it. Very much appreciate you listening. This is Chris Hargraves, and I'm signing off, and I'll see you next time.